And that brings me to our guest today, Lee Gerard Barlow. He is an author at Trebuchet Magazine, premier trainer for the ISI CNB International, the Continental School of Dr. Marco Perret, teaching the arts of magnetism, mesmerism, fascination, and presence-based therapies. Trained as an NLP Master Practitioner under Dr. Richard Bandler Society of Neuro-Linguistic Programming and studied hypnosis and hypnotherapy with the Institute of Clinical Hypnosis in London. His website is arcanetherapies.com. Lee has been working therapeutically with trans states, meditational and yoga-based practices, for the last 20 years and applies his multidisciplinary approach to tailor clinical treatments for his clients' needs. Lee offers classes and retreats teaching meditational techniques and deeper work in presence-based self-development. We will begin with a quote from Lee in response to a question I asked about alchemy. Lee said, presence is a true key and it is not separate from alchemy. Presence is direct and is the raison d'etre of the whole tradition. It unlocks the Gordian knots of the whole mystery. Without this exposure, we can fall into endless speculation rather than direct gnosis. The whole of alchemy, although in some forms literal, it is yet still a mirror of what is within the individual. We may look outside of us, but if we move away from our, our interior position, we again lose the essence we are seeking. Vitriol, V-I-T-R-I-O-L, or Vista Injuris Terra Rectificando Occultem Lapidem. Visit the interior of the earth and you shall find the hidden stone. So much more could be said. There are keys in alchemy, and it is not understood. Welcome, Lee. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for agreeing to come and chat with me. Oh, it's a, an absolute pleasure. Um, it's a little little early here in England. It's, I'm not usually up at this uh, at this hour, but uh, you know, still, nonetheless, it's uh, it's a good thing to be here. Oh, it's a, it's amazing. Maybe uh, <laughs> I'm so grateful that you uh, uh, thought to get up a little bit earlier because of the British summertime. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> summertime and uh, time. Uh, all of this uh, time stuff, you know, it's uh, it bring, brings us uh, to the to the subject of presence, of course, because that's all very uh, very relevant to the concept of time. Absolutely. And um, today we are going to talk about presence, um, but I guess I'll start with a little question I have. Um, I talked to Rupert Sheldrake and I asked him this question because my understanding of quantum mechanics or quantum consciousness is that the observer affects what's observed. Yeah. So um, a lot of scientists believe that it's on the uh, micro level that this effect can be documented and, and observed, but when we get to the macro level, that for some reason they they tend to think that it's not possible or or it's not not the same effect. So, with that said, scientists are saying science has stagnated, become dogmatic practice, mm. fearful of change and progression, while other scientists are postulating a union between the spiritual and the scientific. Does mesmerism fit the criteria of syncretism between science and the sacred? Well, I would, I would, uh, I would absolutely say that I'd be in the affirmative on that for, for certain. I think that was always its position. Um, uh, mesmerism was working, if you like, scientifically with various um, observations. Of, uh, of of our place in the universe and um, <clears throat> our relationship with it. So I would say that, um, say for example, again, you know, this is why I keep keep coming back to the issue of presence because presence 
is very much the key to the working of, of all of these things. Um, in the state of presence, one is actually in the state of pure observation without um, any conceptualization. Um, so therefore, when you're... I mean, presence is... Uh, the mesmerism itself could be said to be... I mean, it's a very, it's, it's a very natural thing for us um, to, be, to be involved in, to, to be working, to be doing. Um, it's, uh, for example, I mean, it's the kind of thing that you would say tribes people may have been very involved in doing uh, way, way back in history. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's based upon, a lot of people think that these things fall into the realms of superstition. But um, in actual fact, uh, we do exist in a sea of uh, eternal energy, and that, that uh, comes from us and through us, as well as being received by us. So um, how we actually work with those things um, and how they affect us, um, if, if, we are more, if we're more present we're more open to what they actually are. We're, we're in a, a state of pure observation. Yes, I, I agree. Um, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how everything that I've learned about mesmerism, listening to your different interviews, yes. um, how this can apply to uh, the current status of our planet, the things that we're going through. I, I, I understand that it could probably do a lot to help keep us in a state of presence so that we're more effective as, as we act appropriately, but can it go a little bit further? Can it do anything further to protect us or to change what's going on on the external? I think, I think the more people that are present, uh, the more people who are engaging in, in, in just simply being present, the, a, a lot of uh, issues that we suffer will actually would actually be um, cleared up as a result of that because in ourselves as individual units um, the majority of our own individual issues and problems come from our own inability to stay away from our tendencies to chase either chase after the past uh, hark back to the past or chase uh, some distant dreams or, or fears about the future haunting us, again, either from the past or the future. And um, the problem being is that these things tie us up in, in all sorts of uh, knots and um, terrible situations, which then lead to situations like personal stress. And um, when, when people are in states of stress, um, we all know what tends to happen with that one. People can very easily pass it on to the next person and so on and so on and so on. So mm -hmm. more uh, an individual remains in a state of uh, equilibrium through uh, practicing presence, the less ripples on that level they cause to the external world. And um, as a result of that, um, it can, can actually have an effect on on the external world uh, in the same way as uh, we, we just discussed the negative effects of, um, of, say, for example, someone blowing their top through high levels of stress. Um, someone who, who is, is in a more present state would, um, well, simply be, simply exist, be, still being very active, but, um, but uh, not having the negative effects upon the world right yeah i, I so, totally so agree who are doing that the, the the better the world would be absolutely and it, it it's it's kind of sad that uh we don't get this kind of training that we're not we're not engaged on any level of religious spiritual um educational wise with our families on a social level to really react or to act in a, in a state of presence or to even understand the concept we're more or less like born <laughs> on mm -hmm. a genetic level <laughs> to be oh, yes. fearful and 
and constantly yeah. in the past or the future, you know, never in the present. Yes, well, um, again, the idea of <clears throat> if we go into, if we start moving into the realms of alchemy a little here, um, we can look at the situation of the world and the way the world is as being a, a downward pointing tendency, which within the four elements of alchemy would be regarded as being, say, for example, the, the element of water. The reason why I say this is because in alchemy you obviously have two light elements and two heavy elements uh, graphically depicted as being two raising elements, fire and air, and uh, two elements pointing downwards, which is uh, earth and water. Now, in, in terms of water, water generally um, esoterically rules emotions, um, and also the the tendencies. So, for example, the general tendency of humankind is to follow the path of least resistance in most things that we do. In actual fact, as a basic law of nature, uh, it would appear. Um, animals even conserve as much energy as they possibly can, rather than expending energy. And so, um, um, the unfortunate effect of this in us as humans is that it, it applies on the psychological realm as well. Right. So, so we, we have, a, have a tendency to think the thoughts which come more readily to our minds than others. Um, sometimes it's an effort to even consider a certain thought or even consider a certain type of action to follow a thought. Um, so we tend to follow the path of least resistance, and this is necessarily regarded as being the the downward stream or the uh, our tendency to follow the heavy, heavy elements. Alchemy obviously is working on the idea of of, of raising those vibrations. Um, presence is is actually the the means and the method, as I say, the key to actually equilibrate those elements um, in the being, in, the, in, in one's own personal being. And um, I think the reason why it's so important uh, to regard this concept is because when it's actually applied in practice in something like mesmerism, um, the effect that it's having upon the individual practitioner is is much more readily passed to the recipient. So the recipient themselves, even though they may not have had any exposure to these things before, may uh, are much more readily available to receive the vibrations of the the, the practitioner. So they themselves can enter into a state of presence much more readily. Perfect. Mm. And this is a kind of alch alchemy. It, in, in, it's not, like I say, it's not separate from alchemy right. in, any, in any respect, because what it actually is is the raising of the vibrations. I mean, everybody's familiar with that book that came out a few years ago called The Secret, and um, a lot of that mentions things about the, the, the raising of thought vibrations and so on and so on. A lot of that, for those who may have looked into it a little deeper, has come from uh, uh, quite a lot of that book came from a book called The Kabbalion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes, I, I am, and, and I've, I've read the beginning of it a couple of times. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not a long, it's not a long book, right? It's, no, it's not. It's not so long. And um, the thing is, is that that. That, I mean, I really do, I always have done, regarded that as an absolute classic of hermetic literature. Um, it, it, it really does have, you know, the major key points, if you like, of the entire hermetic tradition inside that, uh, that one book. And one of, one of the things is, is about the raising of vibrations. And the raising of vibrations in terms of uh, the law of polarities. See, this is the thing again. If people mm -hmm. fall into the law of polarity, 
which is also another another form of the uh, the, the, the laws of vibration being swinging from one pole to another. Um, what what presence kind of is is not just a raising of vibrations, but actually a neutralization, you may say, of uh, these tendencies to be going for the energy to be going too much to one side or too much to the other side. So when a person enters into a proper state of presence, then they are actually, as far as I understand it, uh, certainly neutralizing um, the energies or the tendencies towards one state or another. So maybe we could talk a little bit about how, how we can get into a state of presence. Because I know for myself, I, I tend to to think that I, I have this knowledge of a lot of esoteric ideas and as you're talking about the Kabbalion related to the law of attraction and all this I, I understand the concepts but when I live my life as I go through my day I don't always live in a state of presence I live in a state of anxiousness <laughs> or yeah. looking at the past or yes you know. yes well this is the thing um, when uh, when we're, for example, attempting to do something, um, are we really always there? That's the question. Uh, quite often, the truth is that most of the time we're not. Um, say, for example, if we're if we're doing a menial task, the most likely uh, situation is is that d during during the performance of a menial task that you're going to be drifting somewhere else <laughs> thinking right. thinking about again the past or the future or Im implications of some future event or or even the implications of the past or or just simply daydreaming or something like this well this can uh, in terms of Past regrets can cause sadness in people. Um, in terms of future uh, worries and fears, uh, causes anxiety. And um, these are actually the things which plague us as uh, human beings here on this earth in this day and age. I mean, obviously they always have. I think it's been the way we, we as a human race have always operated this way. But um, I think when we start looking at those individuals who have actually had any level of attainment, um, they tend to live in a, in a way where they, just through their pure being, they help others to feel more um, at ease, more calm. Mm -hmm. And as long as... Uh, the individuals are receiving the correct message, which is in actual fact that it's actually all in them and that they're not chasing after this in someone or something else, then, um, then they're, on, they're on the right track. Now, do, do you get my meaning? It's like yes. If, I, I, if it's, you have a guru, then the guru is, is, is another external thing that absolutely. the individual may be chasing after. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, that seems, not to cut you off, but it seems as if, I'm single, and I've been single for a number of years, and it becomes more and more uh, important to me yes. that I have that self-love and I have uh, that that attitude of presence with myself in all things that I do. And as I'm just getting into this process, I'm you know struggling and faulty in most parts, but I'm I I just see how important it is that. Because of the religious uh, upbringing that I had, and most people have, it's hard for them to even understand this. They think, they look at it, um, like somebody who's deeply religious, they'll look at something like this as being, uh, like, worshipping the self. And it, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with with respecting yourself and loving yourself. And, and as we uplift ourselves in that way, it, it does, as you say, it it spreads our vibrations spread out and affect everything and everyone around us and it and it draws that energy back to us through people and things and situations so it's 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 kind of difficult to 
yeah, I guess it's a it's an ongoing process. It's not you know it's something I have a concept of and understand and can grasp it, but I uh, could I say I live like that? <laughs> no, it's a, yeah it's something I'm striving to achieve. Yes, like well, the the important key is that um, presence is real, mm-hmm. <laughs> as in your every single one of us are real we exist right we are here and um the more we live in our minds the more we are although that you know living living in the mind is an aspect of the reality that we experience it's not the root of reality Mm -hmm. i.e the actual root in physical reality so therefore any any method that helps us to be rooted in physical reality to actually have our anchor here enables us to collapse all of those levels of uh, anxieties and um, the tendency of the mind to to be rushing forwards and backwards all of the time what this actually enables the individual to do, and I, I find this to be extremely useful in therapy for helping people with things like states of anxiety, is we, uh, we offer them um, various practices, mm-hmm. uh, simple exercises, which help the individual um, to, to gradually... Uh, everybody's different, so some have an aptitude... Um, for for doing this maybe quicker than others. But that's, again, you know, nothing to be uh, concerned about. I think, um, again, if if, if you said to somebody, okay, some uh, quicker than others, um, some individuals may go, oh, but I'm not as quick as I should be. Well, again, this the, the issue is, is that that's the mind coming back into play, you see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and... Um, so, therefore, our physical body is actually the thing that keeps us here in reality. We, right. we, we, exi- we exist here like a plant rooted in the mud. You know, we are here. And um, so, for example, the physical sensation. How many people who are listening to this right now Possibly a lot more than normal because of the because of the fact that I've just mentioned it. But uh, <laughs> how many people are aware of their physical body right now? How how many are aware of their left foot? Well, were you aware of your left foot before I mentioned it? Well, when you said my body, my my mind went to my left foot because my right foot is bent and my left foot's standing out so I could see it. Uh, so you <laughs> That's the only reason why. <laughs> so you could see it. I could see it, so I kind of looked at it right before you said it. So you looked at so it. But maybe I knew you were going to uh, say that. <laughs> yeah, you, you looked at it, therefore you were aware of it. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Well, that's not the point, you see. Right. Of what I'm saying. <laughs> the point is that you feel it. Yes not see it and therefore acknowledge it, therefore you have one. <laughs> <laughs> you see, this is the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, for pe- for, for, there's been a, uh, many people, uh, it's been very surprising as I've done research on this over the last couple of years. Um, many people who I may be sitting around talking to and I ask the same question, oh, okay, so can you feel your foot? I've noticed that the, those who are involved in more intellectual pursuits, i.e. physicists, <laughs> for example, mm-hmm. um, have a tendency to stop for a moment, screw their eyes up, and close their eyes, screwing their eyes up, and, 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 and gradually turn around to me and say, well, I can imagine it. Mm-hmm. When I can imagine my foot, yes. Yeah, well, that's a, a that's a big a big part of this mechanistic reality that we live in, very material, 
we 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 are sensory. I mean, everything about this three D experience is sensory. Yes. But it's distorted. It's not natural. Yes, it's it's distorted. Um, I think any psychologist could tell you this. Or, or um, uh, yeah, that that basically, when you're actually. Uh, and people may notice it themselves, you know, depending upon the state of mind that an, an individual is in, um, the, even if the sun is shining, for some people who are feeling a bit down, it may not look so good. Mm -hmm. uh, things may still look qu quite, quite dismal. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Um, that is not reality. That is the individual literally colouring their experience of, of reality. Um, the same can go the other way around. You know, you, you get other people who turn around and go, oh, they always look at the world through rose-tinted rose glasses. Mm -hmm. Well, when in actual fact, don't they, they, doesn't that person see what their life's really like? Mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting as well because, like I say, you know, through working with NLP previously, um, training in NLP and so on, um, this comes into neuro-linguistic programming a lot, these types of things about... The idea of uh, the, the individual's so-called subjective experience, and how that individual, uh, and, and also how how others have have beliefs and values, or sets of beliefs and values, which really have nothing to do with another person's state. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're we're, we're always um, a lot of people are people are a lot of individuals are, are, are looking at the world through obviously through their own perception and not um, and and and, and uh, sticking their impression on top of uh, what someone else is experiencing a lot of the time. So there's the whole idea of, uh, of any level of true objectivity becomes more and more of an interesting issue if we look at it this way. Like what you know what exactly is the objective state? Well, again, um, presence leads a person towards a more objective state because the less the mind is colouring experience, the closer you are to the objective state. Right. Which is a form of alchemy. Mm -hmm. Because, as I say, the downward tendencies um, are tendencies to, to fall into... Um, uh, the heavier. Say again, sorry. You said the heavier, the heavier yeah. elements. What you might call the heavier elements in in the alchemical paradigm um, enables us to, you know, that that situation basically makes it so that we humanity humanity generally goes down the the roots of least resistance. Right. It actually takes an effort. It's like swimming upstream to to put work into doing presence and this is the interesting thing we have to uh, if you look at the uh, again look at the four elements in alchemy you have the upward rising elements now the upward rising elements are actually those elements where we would have to actually put the effort in <laughs> to counteract mm -hmm. the downward elements uh, presence is is such a thing. Um, we, in order to help us overcome these uh, downward tendencies, we need to put uh, attention and effort. But this is not a mental thing. This is not something we imagine. This is something we are. Mm. And it's so difficult for many to actually just be what they are. Yes, yes. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I know with myself, but I, I can only relate to myself, although I, it's a point to other people. <laughs> um, I, I know that um, about eight years ago, and the, the simple of it is that I lost my religion, and I guess I've gone through the dark night of the soul, whatever you want to yeah. call it, and I'm coming out the other side. I haven't really talked about it until the mm -hmm. last year and a half, and... Uh, and it was good I didn't talk to people about it because the mm. only people that I was in contact with were people who it scared the crap out of them. They didn't right. know how to handle it. And now I find that I have to get some kind of spiritual practice. 
I, I, I can't just rely on my intellectual understanding of these principles. No. I need to have some kind of a daily ritual, routine, sacred space, mm. whatever. I'm not sure how to do that, but I know that now is something that I need to incorporate into my life to continue on the path of self-love and evolution of how I want to live my life. So with that said, it is difficult because I have to put in that effort to do the things that I already know. I mean, meditation. Mm -hmm. For five years, everything I open, <laughs> everything I listen to, <laughs> every yeah. email I get or something, somebody's talking about meditation. It's like, mm -hmm. and I'll say either out loud or in my head, I hear you, I mm -hmm. understand, but I don't do it. I just don't make this practice. Is, this is this is the this is a obviously this is a very common issue right. and so for mm -hmm. really nothing to worry about. I right. think it's more common than you can possibly imagine. Um, it's uh, you know you, you have countless individuals who uh, have an aptitude to a proclivity towards these things, um, but actually putting it into practice is a whole different matter, and. Um, there is no other way than to do it. You know, that's the, that's the fact. Um, presence is, is actually a very, very enjoyable way of, uh, of, of doing what others may call meditation. It's, and because it's an active, an active meditation in the sense that, uh, you know, I, I, I call it presence as, as very distinct from what a lot of people call mindfulness because because mindfulness um, has a tendency to sort of stop at a relatively early stage um, and and doesn't have any further implications or further development mm -hmm. with with presence it's something that can be taken a lot lot further um, than its initial application in its initial application it could be said to be um, on a similar line to mindfulness, um, but with presence, we can use it as a as a as a, as, a, as want of a better word, a transcendental thing, because it, in reality, reality itself is very very peculiar, <laughs> mm -hmm. very uh, very um, unpredictable. A bit unpredictable, but the, but I was going to say. Uh, more transcendental than people believe it is. Mm -hmm. I think because people think, look at the look at the world. Um, one of my favourite things. I can I can never rem remember it properly, but there's two things from um, you know the, there's the, there's the thing from the poet William Blake uh, to see eternity, heaven in a wild flower and eternity in a grain of sand. To me, that proves that he experienced the state that I'm talking about. Um, he and also Huxley, uh, which was obviously you know, Huxley came from a more sort of drug-induced type of uh, approach. But again, you know, the, the, if the doors of perception were cleansed, then people would see it as it really is eternal. Mm -hmm. uh, re would see reality as it really is eternal. Right, right. And now those two quotes, although they're coming from different people, um, one a poet and one. Uh, uh, a visionary in in, in uh, exploration with with uh, drugs and so on. Um, they show two completely different ways of approaching the subject. However, uh, William Blake clearly shows the idea of presence that how transcendental reality actually is. That's my point. Right. In, so many individuals feel they need something other than or something more to experience, and and already we live within the conceptualization that reality is mundane, mm. <laughs> and it's not. It's anything but. Yes. It's anything but. It's absolutely anything but. And if 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 we can just be free of conceptualization then we start to see it as precisely that. We see it uh, for the wonder that it truly is. And you were talking about, like, having this in oneself and spreading it out to other people. 
uh, which is true, but actually it's also an act of worship to creation to actually be aware of it. Because what you're doing is you're actually living, you would be living in the wonder of creation itself through the act of being presence, touching eternity. Yeah, um, I, I want to apologize. Um, I was reading something, and I completely didn't hear anything that you just said. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> present. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm not present, and this is so fascinating. Um, the the tech who who's running the show asked yeah. me, I guess it would be considered a personal question, Yes. It's kind of um, neither here nor there, but to answer his question, would I be able to have achieved these goals that I, I'm trying to set for myself in this, on a spiritual level, would it be easier to do with a partner? And I, and I could say definitely I always believed that, that I had to have that in my life. But I, I'm moving towards that if I don't have this with myself, I mm. cannot have this with another person. So I hope that answers their question, and I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I no, missed no. what you said. Absolutely. I'm, 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 sure, uh, I'm sure everybody, um, if anyone, anyone listening um, got that. But, the yeah, it's all relevant. It really doesn't matter. Um, yes, I, I think it's interesting when you start looking at things like relationships and um, other situations uh, any challenging situation which makes us forget ourselves is precisely one of those points where you can make the extra effort to not <laughs> right to not fall prey to that again that's part of the uh, what we might call part of the downward tendency is to is to lose track so presence is also, when done correctly, it is, is a form of concentration as well, except it's not mental concentration. It's just having a direct line to what, what is, to what is there. It's, it's, uh, for want of a better word, it's, an, it's a wakefulness. It's, it's being awake, mm -hmm. which, is, which is more than can be said for me at this point in time. I know, <laughs> my gosh. You're, you're so loving to have even done this and four o'clock in the morning it is there we're getting closer to five i guess um we're coming up to the quarter before the hour and i i know you only wanted to speak for about an hour we can go longer if you choose you can do another 15 20 minutes however you want to do that uh but i want to make sure that you're um going to give us some information about any upcoming uh, classes or any special things that you might be participating in, uh, any other yeah. interviews or other programs. I'd uh, love for you to share that. Yes. Um, first of all, can you hear me properly? Because your uh, line seems to have gone a little strange over this end. Okay. I, I apologize. Me? Yeah, I can hear you perfect. Oh, good. All right. Uh, it's, that's good. Um, yeah. Um, we have a course uh, in, in the UK, which is uh, coming up very shortly in May. Um, and uh, Dr. Perrette, who I actually work with, I'm guesting with him uh, over in Nice. And there's a course there also taking place from the 29th of April to the 4th of May in Nice. That's teaching mesmerism, presence, and fascination techniques, which is the same that I'm doing over here in uh, the UK on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th of May. Um, we should be doing something again in October uh, in the UK, uh, teaching these same techniques. Um, but you can also check, always check on the website, which is www.arcanatherapies.com. And on the website, you can, you can find uh, lots of uh, videos, reading material, and um, information on, on what we're doing, basically, uh, on the courses that we run and so on. And also for individuals over here in the UK, um, obviously open for private sessions as well. And uh, one other point is that for the presence workshops, very, very extended presence workshops, 
um, we will be running them in the Auvergne in central France. And that would be like out in the mountains, um, doing active presence work for like a good solid week, basically, which would uh, definitely get people to a, to a state, into a certain uh, heightened state, I can tell you. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> well, I have one more question. Uh, yes. We have a host here, uh, Sari Sunflower. Her name is Willow, and she's from, uh, is it the county of Surrey or the town of Surrey? Okay. Are you, are you okay. close to there now? <laughs> yeah, quite close. I mean, uh, Surrey is just sort of outside of London, really. Oh, okay. I've been there once, but I was only in Kensington, so I guess that'd be west. Kensington? Yeah. Kensington. Well, Kensington is in London, yes. Yeah. Uh, I went good. to see David Icke, so I was there for the weekend. I had a long weekend. Okay. So, um, And I really liked being there because I, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, uh, so it kind of reminded me, uh, it wasn't exactly, but it kind of reminded me of being in Philadelphia and the old old town Philadelphia and Society Hill. Um, not exactly, but just a lot of the familiarity there, so I really enjoyed it. I just, I felt very comfortable. I didn't, but it was a whirlwind tour of England. <laughs> I really didn't get to see much. I, but, can, um, I can well imagine. I can well imagine, yes. Yeah. I look forward to coming back again. So um, is there anything else that you'd like to um, share with us before you get on to your busy, busy day? Oh, um, well, I, I, I would say that uh, to round things off in terms of the actual practice, um, the actual practice of presence, I, I'd like to connect this idea of presence to mesmerism to make that very clear. And that is, as, as I said before, um, the actual workings of mesmerism is uh, empowered by um, the techniques of presence. So presence has to be, uh, is, is something that has to be worked in order to do a full extensive session of mesmerism um, to, the, to its nth degree. Um, for personal use, uh, the, use of, the use of presence, I would say for a very small amount of time every single day, either by sitting down or by, better still, being active, being actually in motion. If, if you or anyone else as, as individuals dedicate themselves to focusing upon the feeling, not the concept or the imagination, but the feeling of a hand or a foot, while you're actually in your every single, uh, every single uh, every, everyday pursuits, and just keep it there. It doesn't matter if your attention wanders away, it, it, similar to other meditation techniques, but just keep bringing it back. And if you can do it for a little longer than next, uh, you know, after a certain while, if you can do it longer than five minutes and turn it into a ten-minute exercise, and you stick to this, Every single day, you will find that all of the all of the uh, the tendency for thought to fly around all over the place and causing anxiety starts to dr gradually drop away. But it's something that has to be practiced every single day, and as a result, um, you will find that you become much more rooted much more, uh, have, a, have, a, have a, a greater sense of um, personal stability because one is rooted in the body. And then this can be gradually spread throughout the entire body as an exercise. But this, again, takes time. Uh, the workshops that we do um, give this in an intensive form. What I've just given you is a small exercise which is the all the only thing you can realistically do for listeners at this point in time but in intensive situations through workshops we can we can get full presence uh, we people can experience full presence in our workshops and then they understand exactly where they can go with this so that's the idea of running the workshops but as I say just as a, a 
as something to leave for your listeners um, you can work with simply a hand or a foot and work for limited periods every day and just make sure that you keep up that practice and then the benefits of that will become very obvious over a, over, over a period of time. Like I say, some quicker than others, but again, that's not really important. What's important is that you just simply apply yourself to the practice. Absolutely. Any thoughts? Any thoughts that come into the mind while you're doing the practice, simply return to the sensation. Just keep returning to the sensation. If a thought comes again, just return to the sensation. Well, that's wonderful, I, and and I will make an effort to try to practice that this week. And let um, me know how you get along. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Lee. Um, again, your website, arcanatherapies.com. That's right. And um, you said in May you'll have your uh, next is UK it, course. UK yeah. course, and then maybe later you'll have something in France, and people can get a hold of you. At your website, um. that's right. You can you can write to me directly through the website. Um, there's a, a contact point on the website. That's right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So check out arcanatherapies.com and uh, check out Lee Gerard Barlow. And uh, thank you, Lee, for this uh, wonderful conversation about thank presence. You. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, and now I I really like the idea of um, just trying to focus on one part of my body, and uh, whether it be for five minutes, but to do it on a daily basis, and um, that might be a lot easier for me than trying to sit there and meditate. That's right. It's an active an active form of uh, of working, and um, like I say, eventually when this is taken, if this is practiced for long enough then it can become quite enjoyable uh, to enter into challenging situations whereby you normally have your uh, attention removed from yourself. Uh, say, for example, when people you, you go to the shop or somebody calls you up on the phone, that's a good one. If someone calls you up on the phone, immediately your attention is, is drawn away from yourself and is placed upon the external condition. And as a result of that, people lose their sensation of their body. Wow. And the idea is to work against that tendency and immediately return to the sensation. In the same way as I just told you that if any thought comes while you're practicing, you return to the sensation. In it, Once that this has been worked for a, an extended period of time, then you can start going, oh, okay, so the phone rings. Ah, the phone rings. Right straight away I'm back to the sensation of my foot and I'm keeping it. <laughs> you know, it's, yes. it, sounds, it sounds odd, but actually this is, it really does collapse many of the um, mental constructs that we have about things and as a result uh, diminishes our tendency to be uh, rooting around in the past or the future, which actually gives us a more deconceptualized but much more objective uh, perception of reality as it actually is which actually results in a feeling of peace. Right. And uh, so there's many, many benefits for this. And m much more clarity of action as well as a result of that. Yes, that's what I was thinking. It definitely will help my thinking processes a lot better. And on, on, the, uh, on the energetic level and on the alchemical level as well, a raising of a raising of, of, of vibrations or a neutralization of disharmonious vibrations because harmony was the key state of, of uh, that was the object of, of what Mesmer himself was attempting to do was actually bring people into a state of harmony and so Mesmerism like I said is, some, is, is an art which when applied to a recipient brings them to this state of harmony and presence immediately that's Thank you. And you can find out more about mesmerism and Lee Gerard Barlow at his website, Arcana Therapies. Thank you, Lee. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank